Hi, and welcome to Physics Fundamentals. I'm your host, Angie, and today we're in the studio with Jim Gates. Welcome, Jim. Uh, glad to be here, Angie. We are so honored to have you. All right, so we don't want to start this interview without uh, touching on your bio. And it's quite extensive. You've done a lot. You have wonderful stories and so forth. So you received your bachelor's and PhD, right, from MIT? Yes, MIT, uh, two bachelors, two one math, one physics, yeah. And um, you also ha were awarded a medal? You received a distinction yes. in 2013? In 2013, uh, President Obama uh, had a ceremony in the White House where I received the National Medal of Science. Which we're going to talk a little bit about more about that because we have this picture of Obama laughing and we, yes. we want to know a little more. <laughs> yes. But in, in addition to that, uh, you were for, for a few, many years actually here at Brown, five years at Brown, and you were the director, right? Yes, we established the Brown Center for Theoretical Physics and I was its inaugural director. And we're sad that you decided to retire, but... Well, life, as you know, is complicated, <laughs> but I haven't disappeared yet. I'll be back. Right. We're going to miss you, and you'll be transitioning. Uh, yes. Uh, I tell people this is a second planned failed retirement, because <laughs> the second time in my life when I've gone from one job to another, I've been unemployed for less than 12 hours each time, because I was actually just changing jobs. So I'm going to continue to do physics and be a professor at the University of Maryland going forward. But you'll still maintain your ties here? Uh, yes, I have students here that I'm working with, and I would always be happy to return and visit. I have had a fantastic time here at Brown University over the last five years. I believe I've actually done the best research of my career here. So that, so you know, how can you how can you feel bad about that? Right. Wonderful. Um, the other thing I, I notice in your bio is um, just all that you've done. You've worked on commercials, which we're going to talk about. Um, you have also written some books, which we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to start uh, the series. This is the first in our series entitled, Why I Chose Physics, where we're going to delve into careers in physics and the career path that led to, for example, Jim becoming a physicist. Jim, we can't wait. You have so many wonderful stories and anecdotes. And we would love to cover it all, but we just don't have the time. But we will try. Well, we'll do the best we can. Yes, we'll do the best we can. Um, why don't we start with your childhood? Tell us a little bit about your childhood, your sure, parents. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, my father spent 27 years in the U.S. Army. Uh, my mother was a housewife, a 1950s housewife. She didn't even know how to drive a car. Uh, but uh, they uh, met during World War II, got married. He went off to the war and came back, uh, fortunately, with no injuries and what have you. And then in 1950, they had me. Uh, so, but because I was in the Army, I spent part of my childhood on living on Army bases. And when I was uh, three years old, we moved to Canada to live in a base called uh, Fort Pepperell. It's in St. John's, Newfoundland. And f for reasons I don't really understand to this day, uh, at least definitively, my mother took her three children to see a science fiction movie. The title of the movie was Space Ways, and it's a really strange little movie. It's a murder mystery, it's a love story, and it's a science fiction story all rolled into one with 1950s style technology for doing this. But uh, when I saw the movie, the thing I came away with was, I, A, I heard about this thing called science, and what I understood in my four-year-old mind was it was a doorway to adventure and fun. What else does a four-year-old boy want? <laughs> um, so it wasn't uh, a mentor. It was actually a movie that a movie uh, got you interested in science. Interested. I learned the word. I, it also got me interested in space travel and science fiction and what have you. But yeah, that's how it started. Let's just talk a little bit about the area that you're focusing on. Your, in, your focus is, or you specialize in supersymmetry, supergravity. That's correct. Did I leave anything out? Well, no, no. You're uh, basically, uh, these uh, words that you just mentioned are actually at the foundation of something that generally is known in the public as string theory. So I actually wrote uh, MIT's first thesis right. on this I was subject. I mention that. And you also got your bachelor's and PhD, right? At MIT, MIT, absolutely. Right. Um, yes, I couldn't decide which major to do, so I did them both by accident <laughs> is what happened. But I stayed in PhD program at MIT in the physics department, finished in 1977. In those days, this piece of mathematics that has the title supersymmetry 
had just been discovered. And nobody else at MIT understood why it would be important except for one little graduate student, that would be me. And so I wound up writing the first thesis on the subject at MIT. And I've spent my entire year uh, studying this very strange piece of mathematics and its implications for our universe if this mathematics is an accurate description. Wow, and also you've done some groundbreaking uh, research too. You yes, I, also. yes. Uh, in but the before area. we get to that, okay, um, let's go back to your high school, your middle school sure. so you, you, year. So you saw this movie and yes. you were intrigued. Yes. And then what happened? So um, th this was before I began school. So this was in Canada. Uh, and then as uh, in 1956, we left Canada to move back to the United States as a family because my father was then posted to an army base in El Paso, Texas, Fort Bliss. Mm -hmm. And so in 57, that's when I started school. And when I started school, um, mathematics was, arithmetic was actually very simple. I was actually counting before I started to go Always. to school. <laughs> no, the hard part was language arts. Oh, wow. I had difficulty learning to read. And one day, um, there was a parent-teacher conference, and my teacher said, you know, he looks like he's really trying hard, but I bet if he bought some books about something he really was interested in, he'd become a good reader. My father remembered that his four-year-old son had gotten interested in science and space travel, so he brought home four books on space travel. Needless to say, I was reading very well very quickly right, after that. Right. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that there was a golden path laid out. My father had listened to his four-year-old son and then brought that information forward to the eight-year-old version. So by that, after that, I start reading science fiction voraciously. Um, I love, I've always loved mathematics. In fact, my family, mathematics is, has a strange relationship to us. My grandfather could neither read nor write, but he could do arithmetic. Um, my dad never finished high school, but I remember watching him study for his equivalence exam, and he was studying t uh, trigonometry, uh, plane geometry, and the beginnings of calculus. We like math in my family, it turns out, which, like I said, is kind of a strange thing to say. I like to say it's a family business. Um, so all through school, uh, you know, life was good. I, you know, I so you never um, deterred from the, or, or strayed from the path. You just stuck with science for the... Science and math have always been the things I wanted to do as long as I've been, a conscious, been conscious of their existence. Mm, great. Now, for middle school, like let's say we have a viewer, a young viewer, what would be your recommendation? Maybe they can relate to your story. They've seen a Star Wars or some wonderful movie. Sure. Movie. So the thing that I tell young people, uh, and I'm now 71 years old, is when I was in middle school, I was reading comic books. I was reading science fiction. I saw the, I, I had used to have a whole collection of Marvel comics back in the mm -hmm. 60s. And that actually went together with the other part of what I was hoping would be my future. Namely, I could see fantastic possibilities in science fiction and comic books. And my, uh, the characters I liked the best, the ones that were my role models, were all scientists. There was Reed Richards, the leader of the Fantastic Four. There was Bruce Banner, who was the Hulk. There was Henry Pym, who was the Ant-Man. And so, I understood that there was a connection between the adventures that I was reading about, even though they were fanciful and I didn't expect them to happen, and the mathematics and the science that I was learning in high school. And so, since I had this four-year-old fascination with science, this just, this just reinforced everything that I had been thinking about. Wonderful. For our young viewers who are watching and can relate to your childhood, what would be your recommendation? How would you, um, what's your advice to them? What should they do? Have fun. <laughs> no, seriously, have fun. Uh, no one in your life is going to make sure you have fun but you. And so uh, I was having fun in middle school, reading comic books, reading science fiction, and but I understood that it had a connection with my deep love of mathematics and science. My favorite um, character in James Bond was Q. Ah, <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah, my favorite yeah. character in Star Trek was Spock. Oh, okay, right, right, right. <laughs> All right, so moving on to family, because you mentioned you, you come from a family of uh, math lovers or mathematicians. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your children. You're a father of two, and what did you instill in them, and how how is that? Sure. So uh, let me start by talking about someone else who's very important in that, namely my wife. Right, uh, right. Diane and I have been married 38 years now, and she's a medical doctor. Um, 
When our twins were born, uh, we did some things that other people might find a little bit unusual. Uh, so first of all, my son spontaneously showed that he could add at age two and a half. And we were so surprised, and so we threw a party for him. Uh, he mastered all of the basic arithmetic operations uh, probably by the time he was four, but except for one. Mm. My daughter was the first person to figure out how to divide. Every time when the children did that, we gave a party. So in our family, when you accomplish something, and it wasn't coming from books, so you know, they're playing just like ordinary kids do, most normal kids. But when you see signs that your children are mastering these kinds of skills, it needs to be a family celebration. So that's one thing that we did. Okay. Uh, another thing uh, that always uh, seemed to be prevalent in the family was uh, they knew uh, that I was a scientist and a teacher and I would often have visitors uh, at the house, my graduate students, some undergraduates, uh, visiting scientists, collaborators. And I think what happened is that the children got the idea that um, this thing called science was actually kind of a game because we were always so enthusiastic and making progress. So as a result, uh, to my very great surprise, both my children look like they're going to be some flavor of physicist. My daughter is currently studying um, black holes uh, in a postdoctoral research position at Princeton University. My son is still in graduate school. Uh, he's in a biology PhD program, but he works in the laboratory of a physicist. So it looks like he's going to be a biophysicist. So, you know, a lot of people hear this story. They say, oh, that's great. And I say, no, 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 you don't understand. When they were thinking about what they would major in in high school, I used to say, Go to business school because dad needs a retirement <laughs> plan. <laughs> but they, they, I'm sure they've just followed your path just because, yeah. Like I said, we it's think in the they, DNA, right? We, it's in well, DNA we think that they, I th we think that they were exposed too much to the fun that scientists have. Yeah. Now, I, I did gloss over your wife. Let's go back. How did you meet her? When did you meet her? Sure. Um, was it in high school? And no, no, no. I should, you know, I have friends who uh, have who met their future wife while they were in elementary school. And I'm, my, life, my story is nowhere like that. So I met my wife at MIT. Um, she and I both are alums. And uh, she was a student. Uh, and it, I, have to t I tell people all the time, when we first met, it was hate at first sight. Because, really? yes, absolutely, because I was teaching her uh, physics. She was not interested in learning physics. It was a summer class. And so I kept trying to do things to get her engaged. And she, and, 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 but I didn't realize, but she looked upon me as picking on her. So we didn't start off. So as, you're trying to get her attention. but I'm she, trying to get her to focus on me. I mean, she's thinking, I'm picking on her. So we start off not wanting to be in the other's presence at all. Uh, a few years later, uh, she, oh, there was a, uh, a uh, activity that we used to call Black Bowl at MIT where groups of us African-American students would get there at a bowling alley because they used to have a bowling alley on campus. So we'd go down there and have fun. And so she and I both were participants, you know, and then that, you know, so finally I think that got us each past the attitude that the other was the most terrible person on the planet. And then a few years later I was actually working uh, in the program and she was actually tutoring and I found out that she's like a really interesting person, really dedicated, committed to uh, building a, a life and uh, so that's how we got together. That's how you got together. Yeah. Um, I remember when we uh, were discussing this uh, on our Zoom, there was a picture of you and I think there was Hawkins in that picture. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about sure. the individuals there, you met while you Yeah, were there's there. a picture that has uh, been pretty widely disseminated from 1980 there was a conference that Stephen sponsored at Cambridge University. It was a so-called Nuffield meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, he was interested in learning about the implications of the mathematics that people like me have been developing, in particular how to extend that to Einstein's theory of general relativity. So he invited uh, all of us young people there to basically get a jump start in coming to understand uh, the problem of what we call quantum gravity. So that's how I met Stephen the first time. Uh, he gave a lecture at the end of that, and it was amazing to me because he was already um, confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. He could barely speak legibly, but he could still speak. 
And he gave this lecture, and I sat in the back of the uh, audience, and I thought to myself, he's the bravest physicist I have ever met. Mm -hmm. Be, uh, because I was thinking, if I was in that condition, I would not be comfortable talking to my colleagues in that sitting. But he was moving forward with his life. And so that was one of my meetings, the first meeting with Stephen. Um, uh, got a chance to go to his house, and so there are pictures of me at his house. I'm, we were playing croquet. I, I've never seen these pictures, but I've been told there are pictures of me at his house playing croquet. Uh, there's some pictures with the family, and our lives intersected a number of times. Once was in 1998. Um, he was giving a, a, a speech in the White House. Um, since he could not handle a spontaneous question and answer, they wanted to have some physicists in the audience that would do that for him. I was one of those people. Uh, and then the last time I saw Stephen was actually in 2012. We were both in South Africa at the time. Stephen was a world traveler, so even though you know he had this terrible medical condition, you could bump into Stephen any place in the world. I have one of your books. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, the books you've published. Sure. Um, this is Proving Einstein, right? Yes, that's the, that's the fifth book that I've fifth? actually yeah. uh, authored so or co-authored. Tell us about the very first one, because that's an interesting story. Okay, yes. so the first book, is entitled L'Arte della Fisica. It's Italian. Mm -hmm. It means the art of physics. And the reason it has an Italian title is because the book is written in Italian. Which is amazing, right? Well, I don't <laughs> know if it's amazing. So back in the, those days, and this is like the late 70s and early 80s, I used to spend each summer in Italy at the International Center of Theoretical Physics. This is a center that was established by a Nobel laureate uh, by the name of Abdus Salam. And for whatever reasons, he thought it was important that I should be uh, able to come because I didn't have the financial support otherwise. And so there were always grants that I could go there. At the end of the day, I figured out, like maybe 10 or 15 years later, he wanted me to see theoretical physics done at its highest levels by all the peoples of the world, not just the picture that you get coming to the United States where you see very few people of color engaged in this. And it had a profound impact on later things uh, like my writing my writings that were cited by the Supreme Court of the United States, that all stems from that initial uh, uh, mentorship that uh, Optus gave to me. So the first book is a story about physics. It's about my views of uh, my life. It has some of my biography, and then about some uh, discussions of uh, what it takes to do physics, and more or less the sort of thing that we did here. So that's the first book. That's the first book, in, written in Italian. And it's a, yeah. yeah, I had a 500 word Italian vocabulary. Right, right, That's not right. sufficient to write a book, but I had a co-writer right. who actually uh, turned it into Italian. Well, let's talk about the other books, because I also have here Reality in the Shadows, which you wrote it while you were at, um, not yeah. Brown? or. No, uh, Reality was actually written uh, while I was still at Maryland. Uh, oh, okay. So let's talk about this one. <laughs> let's uh, talk about Okay, Proving Einstein, Einstein right. right was written yes. while I was here at Brown. Yes. So I'm not... Uh, a natural book writer, a natural author. All, every single one of my books was initiated by someone coming to me saying, let's do something like a book. Like that first book, it was the publisher who came to me, uh, mm -hmm. The Arte della Fisica. Um, this book has a, another story. Um, so, you know, I've, been, uh, I've done two commercials in my life. Uh, the first one was for, Veri for Verizon and the second for TurboTax. Well, one evening, uh, my co-author uh, to be, uh, Kathy Pelletier, who's a, an established novelist and great writer and great friend to this day, um, was on her couch uh, in northern Maine looking at TV, and she had wanted to write a book about science. But since he had no science background, she figured she needed to get a co-author with a science background. So she was sitting on the couch, and a commercial came on, and it was the TurboTax commercial. Mm -hmm. And she got an impression from my appearance and behavior in the commercial that here's a physicist, a scientist that looks like he's really approachable. So she sent me an email message. Which you are. You are very approachable, well, right? Yeah. No, I, just I, I like to tell people uh, that I'm a mathematical ditch digger <laughs> inside of my head, so there's <laughs> no elevation there from right, my right, perspective. Right. Um, so she did approach me, sent me email. We started talking. She had some ideas, and I wasn't really... Um, really interested in those, but we kept on talking. I found her to be a very interesting personality as a person, and a, you know, uh, that was of course encouraging. And then finally, uh, she had some ideas about writing about Einstein, but they were not the kind of thing that 
that I was interested in. Uh, they were transcripts uh, of, uh, from his secretary. So, you know, a different view on Einstein. But that wasn't what I wanted to do. And then um, we kept talking. And Einstein, by the way, is my hero Maximus in science, uh, the scientist that I most highly admire. And for well, maybe 15 or 20 years, I had wanted to write a book for my students so that they could understand that it's often when you start to learn these things, it seems like you'll never be able to accomplish what these other people have. Uh, I like to say that uh, you get a sense that uh, science was created by alien zombie geniuses, right? <laughs> so who wants to be an alien zombie genius? You're a person, right, as a young person. So I wanted to write a book that would allow young people to see more about the reality of being a scientist, not not what you see in the movies, not what you read about in science fiction, uh, you know, like, uh, and not what you hear about in the real world. I mean, because the lives of scientists are almost never discussed as, as I have seen them for 40 years. So I, I want to write a book with that theme. This book, Proving Einstein Right, is that book. It's a book not about Einstein, actually. It's about the people that made it possible for Einstein to achieve global uh, fame about proving Einstein right means that some people had to go out and sacrifice decades of their lives to get the observations to show that the mathematics of Einstein is accurately describing our universe. And that's what the book is about, about their adventures. And that's why I wanted Kathy as a co-author, because with her exquisite ability as, an, as a novelist and as an author, the story gets told at, at the level that I wanted to do it, that also recognized I would never be a great writer. I also like what you said. You didn't want to be a Brian Greene or any of the other writers. Yeah, you just yeah. wanted to. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people who write science books for the public, Brian Greene, Neil deGrasse Tyson, many, many others. And that's not what I'm trying to do when I write books. I, I want to write books so, uh, that if people will open the co books and look at them, they will see uh, a reflection of themselves, even if they're not a scientist. That's the kind of book I want to write. And so that, Proving Einstein was that way. My previous effort here on the table, yeah. uh, Reality on the, in the Shadows, yes. is very much... I can't wait to read this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. very much, uh, a, it's a different take on science. It's mm -hmm. basically tries to explain how theoretical physics came into existence. Uh, and uh, the story about that book is to me even more interesting because what happened there is one of my co-authors, uh, Frank Blitzer, uh, who was a rocket scientist who helped develop rockets back in the 60s and 70s, uh, wanted to write a book for his grandson mm. uh, that would explain what physics is. And he had completed a manuscript and it had a number of issues and he came to me and uh, eventually, you know, agreed that uh, he'd like to have me as a co-author. I said, I'd be happy to, because I also had wanted to do that. Um, there are a number of childhood documentaries that, uh, there's a, the J Jacob Bernowski's Ascent of Man, and there are a whole bunch of PBS type things that I thought one day I'd like to do that. This book is my attempt to do that, but it started with, uh, with uh, Frank. And we have also took on an, another co-author, uh, Stephen Sakula. And Stephen is one of the scientists that worked at the laboratory where the Higgs boson was discovered. So we had a team that was crystallized by Frank's, uh, Frank's desire. And like I said, this is a book about where did theoretical physics come from, from our perspective. Now, speaking of Frank Blitzer, uh, he wanted the, to write a book for his grandson. What's your um, target audience for these books? I mean, for our young viewers, would you recommend? Yes, uh, all of my books are meant for anyone who, uh, I mean, let me put it this way. When I was in junior high school, I would have loved to have had these books. That's where I start mm -hmm. in an audience. I mean, in fact, in some sense, all of my books about are, are attempts, even though I can't do time travel, they're attempts to go back and think about what I was thinking about as I was going through middle school and high school and even elementary school. What was I thinking about in terms of what science was? Because there were very few books who actually opened the door. That's what I try to do with my books. Now you mentioned Abdus Salam and, and diversity and so forth. Tell us a little bit about your experience um, as a person of color when you were going to school and then we'll, well, the second part is 
Um, what are you encouraged by what you see now in, regard, in regards to you know diversity, inclusion, sure. and equality? So let me um, give you a little bit of my educational background because I have kind of a strange background. I told you I, I lived in uh, Canada for a while. We moved to Texas, uh, Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. That's where I began school. And uh, we were always, there were always one or two African-American families in the communities that I lived at that part of my life. And um, the thing that was interesting about the military in the 50s and 60s is that that was the only place in American society where diversity actually existed. And the reason that was true was because in 1948, the president of the United States, who was uh, Harry Truman at the time, issued an executive order that the United States military would no longer be segregated. Mm. Now, he issued that order in part because of what happened to a number of black veterans that returned from World War II. There was this one gentleman whose first name is Isaac, and I can't remember his last name, who, when he came back from the war, was riding home on a bus, and the bus driver asked him to sit at the back of the bus. And he said, look, he had his uniform on. He said, look, I've just returned from fighting for this country. I can sit anywhere I want to. The bus driver at the next stop called the police, saying that uh, this gentleman had been uh, rowdy. And they took him off the bus, and they beat him so badly that they blinded him. Yeah. And this story made its way to Harry Truman as President of the United States. And so it seems to have played a role in why he, uh, why he issued that executive order. That executive order meant that as in my childhood, I was growing up in a diverse society when there was almost no diversity anyplace else in this country. Uh, so that's first grade, second grade, third grade, part of fourth grade. In fourth grade, uh, my biological mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, in the U.S. military and the Army, the best hospital facilities that the Army has are in, Fort, are in Fort Sam Houston and San Antonio. So my father was transferred from Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. And this was the first time I didn't live uh, on a, a, in a facilities affiliated with a, an army post. We, in fact, lived with a relative, the lady who had raised my mother uh, when she was an, uh, effectively an orphan in San Antonio. And the school we went to was more diverse in the sense that there was a smaller number of European-American students, a greater number of Hispanic-American and African-American students than previously. But again, we were still all in the mix. And then after my mother my mother's death. About a year later, my dad remarried. This, my stepmother was a school teacher in Orlando, Florida. And so we moved to Orlando, Florida. And that was the first time I lived in an exclusively African American community. And I began to notice a number of things. Um, that what's, I, I, I began to understand what segregation does to students of color. One of the first, um, for me, memorable experiences occurred when a young man uh, named Michael at recess uh, said, uh, and this was sixth grade, said, you know, you're pretty good in school. And I, and I sort of thanked him. And then he said, and I, his words, these are his words, but you'll never be as smart as a white boy. Now, for me, that was weird because, you see, I had always been one of the best students in all those classes yeah. beforehand where most of the students were European-Americans. So um, I learned a lot about racism in Orlando, and, uh, but the thing I guess I learned most was from my teachers, because I had absolutely superb teachers. Um, my first drill instructor in logic was an African-American woman named Edna Williams. Uh, my algebra teacher, Mr. William Saunders, but most of all, my physics teacher, Mr. Freeman Coney, all of them were African-Americans and all demanded excellence, every single one of them. Since, I, well, I wound up being the valedictorian in my class, so mm -hmm. I was always a straight-A student, but they pushed me, even though I was the best student, they, they pushed me, each of them pushed me, and them and so many others. My language arts teacher, Miss Delma Dudley, for example, um, and Miss uh, Letty Weaver, these folks pushed me. You know, I'm impressed you remember the names of all your teachers. <laughs> well, I don't remember them all. <laughs> but, I mean, but that's, that's But there's impressive. a number. The There's a number that hammered on me. I remember those. Those me. people laying the hammer on wow, me. Wow. But uh, so. So it helped to be at the school that was predominantly African American. Yes, because it prepared me for, uh, 
for two things. It prepared me, A, to understand that I, I had a capacity to perform even at levels that I hadn't imagined. Mm -hmm. And B, it also inculcated in me the uh, belief that African Americans are not intellectually disabled in anything that we attempt to do. You know, the very first time I saw you, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, introduce myself or come up to you because I was too embarrassed, I'm too shy, I would say. I was just way too shy. <laughs> but um, it was at an NSBP, National Society oh of Black God. Physicists. Yes. And we, you know, me and a few friends were like, oh, there he is. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're a little awestruck. Oh, my God. Um, but it was, it was really nice to be amongst um, fellow scientists that, um, you know, we had that commonality. Sure. So, I think our viewers would, you know, if they're, especially if they're in college, high school, to, to join, would you, would you recommend joining sure. like Sure, so as you know, I'm, you know, I'm a past president of the National Society of Black Physicists and a past president of the American Physical Society, so I, I'm the only person in history who's done both of those things. Um, so it, it is important uh, to, for, especially for young people, more generally for young people who think they are going to, to uh, have a great love and desire to do science. I, at this point, I say it's really important to try to get organizations that will foster and support you and mentor you. you. And, yeah. mentor you. and the NSBP, I had the, much the same reaction, by the way, that you were talking about. 1977 or maybe 78 was the first time I knew about the National Society of Black Physicists. And I went to this meeting and I was stunned because there were black physicists, <laughs> right? I mean, not just me and not just yeah. me and maybe one or two of them, there were lots of them, lots right? Of them. You know, I'm like, yes. whoa. And let me just mention the NSBP has always been open to anybody. We, there was never a bar on ethnicity. In fact, NSBP was born because the American Physical Society would not support African American physicists. Mm -hmm. And so they actually, it's funny, APS is sort of birthed the NSBP because of their inability to advocate for physicists of color. Okay. So are you encouraged by what you see? I mean, the numbers are still low of women and minorities, you know, um, yeah, native man. and yeah. so forth. Uh, Am I encouraged? Well. I are mean, you encouraged by what you see with that? Well, are we yeah. making any advancements? So what I like to tell people is that we're, ma we're moving at a blazingly glacial speed, which means not very <laughs> fast, right? Glacial means something extraordinarily slow. Um, am I encouraged? All I can say is there are small signs of change, at least there have been over the course of my lifetime. But the most troubling thing is, uh, well, let me put it this way. I was the chairman of the physics department at Howard University for two years, from 1991 yeah, to 19, okay. most people don't, okay. from 1991 to 1993. In that period, uh, we raised about $12 million in new sponsored research for the department. Uh, one grant was with, a, one of those large grants was the National, National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So we established the Center for the Study of Terrestrial and Extraterrestrial Atmospheres. I was its first uh, inaugural director there, just like I was the inaugural director here at Brown for the Brown Theoretical Physics Center. And we also established a collaboration with the Department of Energy to work at the Advanced Photon Source, which is a laboratory in Illinois. So why was I doing that? Well, if you look at my professional trajectory, that looks like a divergence. Because I, look, MIT, Harvard, Caltech, <laughs> University of Maryland, right? Mm -hmm. And now suddenly I'm over here at a historically black college. Well. I had always been uh, of the mind that that should our society decide that people who look like me cannot go to places like MIT, Harvard, or Caltech, mm -hmm. the only places where people like me are going to be able to get the intellectual support is going to be at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it would be an intellectual lifeboat. And so at that point in my career, I was able to make a contribution to build up the strength of that lifeboat. And now, why is that relevant? Well, in the last six, seven, eight years, there's lots of sign that our country could, in fact, reverse the things that we've thought about as progress over the course of my lifetime. And I've always been aware of that possibility. And so, um, th yes, we've made progress, but that progress can be swept away mm -hmm. and may be swept away. And so I've done my part, like I said, to create a stronger intellectual lifeboat. Thank you. All right. 
Well, when I said that uh, you're approachable, it's because I, I just wanted our viewers to know that I had sent you multiple emails. Yes. In hopes of a sit down or to do something for physics fundamentals. But it took me walking in right before your class <laughs> this semester uh, for you to say yes. But you were so, uh, you're so kind and gracious to me. You said, well, I think I can do it. So. Well, uh, you know, uh, the reason that one that I have for doing this sort of thing is always to get this message out that what I've learned is that the, the universe has gifted all of our species with the ability to have an intimate conversation with it. Mm -hmm. That requires science and mathematics. And that as a person of color, I have had the time of my life in that conversation. You know, it's been a pleasure thus far, but we're out of time. I can't man I cannot manufacture more for you. You just have too many stories. But um, this will not be it. We have part two coming. So uh, stay tuned. And thank you once again, Jim. Oh, thank you, Angela, for the opportunity.